Statistics and Excel. Central Limit Theorem Population with Data Skewed to the Right Example. Get ready and some coffee, because if we want to get futuristic, we're going to need statistics and Excel. Here we are in Excel. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one, because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunchy numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Well, if you don't have access to this workbook, that's okay because we'll basically build this from a blank worksheet. However, this time we are starting with a beginning data set, which we found on Kaggle, a great resource to find practice data sets to practice with. If you don't find this exact data set, that's okay. You can make your own data set. You can find a different data set and still follow along with the exercise. The idea being that we would like to have a data set that is fairly large, representing the entire population from which we can pull multiple examples. And ideally, the original population data set is not gonna be bell-shaped because that will allow us to better test the central limit theorem. However, if it is bell-shaped, it's okay. You can still follow along with the example problem. It's just that the idea here is that even if the data was not bell-shaped, we can still apply concepts related to the central limit theorem. If you want to build your own data set, you can use the random number generator, which will give you kind of a, like a uniform distribution of data set as well to follow along with. If you do have access to this workbook though, there's currently three tabs down below. We've got the example tab, the practice tab, the blank tab, the example tab, in essence, the answer key, the practice tab having pre-formatted cells so you can practice the practice problem with less Excel formatting and the blank tab just has that original data set and then we will practice the Excel formatting, building everything as we go. Let's go to the example tab to get an idea of what we will be doing. We're going to take our data. We're going to add a little bit to the data just to number the data. We'll give a count on the data. We look at the histogram. We'll create that histogram and say, what is this data looking like in terms of its shape? If we create the histogram, we can see it's going to be skewed to the right, not exactly a normal uh, type of distribution. Obviously, we like the normal distribution oftentimes when we're analyzing data because we can make assumptions about a normal distribution that can help us with our analysis. So we're gonna then apply multiple samples or take multiple samples, we're gonna say of 15, and we're gonna take a bunch of uh, samples here and then get the mean of all of those samples and then we'll create another histogram based on that data and then we'll actually create a, a bell-shaped curve from it. I wanna keep practicing making these graphs because I think the visualization of these graphs is uh, really important. It'd be a little confusing to make these graphs, so we'll keep on practicing that as we go. Now, the, the practice tab has pre-formatted cells in them, so you can go through the practice problem with less Excel formatting. The blank tab, all we have is the data set. I'm gonna delete this bit and we'll just go right from the data set. So the data set we found, I believe this is cars and we're looking at horsepower related to different cars. All right, and so we chose that. We basically chose it though, just because it doesn't have an exact normal distribution. It seems to be skewed to the right. So let's start by formatting our data. I'm gonna make the top bit a header. So I'm gonna say, let's make this uh, black and white. I'm gonna zoom in a bit, holding control down. Uh, zooming in. Let's format all of our cells. I like to select the triangle to select the entire worksheet. Right click and then format uh, all of the cells. And I'm going to make all the cells currency. 
negative numbers bracketed and red and I'm going to remove the decimals to start off with should not change these numbers much because those that's the format that they are currently in home tab let's go font group and make it bold in other words we don't have any decimals that we have to deal with uh, with the with the original data of these numbers for the most part all right now I'd also like to give us the count sometimes I like to add another row that just is going to give me the count even though I can use a function to count them so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select column a I want to make a column to the left of it right click on it and insert and I'm just going to call this my number of rows or the count uh, so let's go make this black and white and then I'm just going to say this is one two I can select those two double click on the fail handle copying it down I'm going to put my cursor in the table hold control shift and down and see go to the bottom so that there's 392 pieces of data here sets of data so I'm going to go up to the top again and let's make this smaller double clicking on it on the top here and then let's make all of this data I'm going to take all of this and say control shift down and I'm going to make it bordered and I'm going to make it this time I'm going to make it this yellow color and that's going to indicate to me that it's kind of that's like my starting data that I'm going to be pulling from and then I'll make my data inputs in blue basically is going to be the idea here all right let's make a skinny n and let's put some basic information about the entire population so we have the count let's count the number of of uh, uh, items we have which we we just did but I'm going to do it this way count we use the count function because we have numbers that we're counting I'm going to say control shift down ba boom and there it is now notice if I was counting like these that don't have numbers I can also do the count with letters so I'd have to use count a just to show you that if you're counting something that doesn't have numbers count alphabet I think is what they were thinking because we're using text fields so count alphabet instead of count numbers and it'll still get you that same thing and then we could say okay give me the mean that's going to be the average of the data equals the average tab so we're going to take all of this data and then divide by the number of items in it so that's going to give us our average uh, 104 I can give it a couple decimal places go into the number group adding some decibels and let's look at the STD for the population that's the standard deviation for the population equals the STD for uh, the pop so there it is and I'm just gonna select this cell and say control shift down again control shift down and enter so there we have it boom let's add some decimals to that one number group adding some decimals all right let's put some brackets around this duh, duh, and let's make this time I'm gonna make it blue if you don't have that blue it's in the more colors standard color wheel I'm gonna make it that blue boom all right so now why so notice if we have the entire population it's useful to look at a situation where we have the entire population look at the mean and the standard deviation and then think about what would happen if I take multiple examples or samples from that population and think about what those samples tell us about the population now notice in practice in future courses or presentations we're going to apply this to to in practice and in practice we often don't know the entire population that's the point of taking the sample to try to get some information about it so it's great to work backwards to have the population to then test our ideas so then when we don't have the entire population we have some concept of of what's going to happen right and so that's going to be the idea here now if we we did not have the entire population then it's possible that we we have an idea of what the mean is in the entire population and the standard deviation however it's also possible that we don't know the mean or don't know the standard deviation and or don't know the standard deviation when we take our samples so those are things to keep in mind when we're when we're looking at something that's going to be bell shaped what do we need to know we need to know the center point and we need to know basically the standard 
uh, deviation. All right, and so if, if we know those things about the population, then we might be able to treat that a little bit different than if we don't know, then the question is, well, how, how well can I approximate the mean and the standard deviation from the samples we're taking? So I just wanna keep that, those things in mind as we, as we think about this concept. Let's go ahead and make a histogram from this just to look at the data. I'm gonna put my cursor up top, control shift down. I wanna go back up to the top because that's where my chart needs to go. So I'm gonna say control backspace, bringing me back up. I'm gonna to go to the insert tab up top and I'm just gonna make a histogram in the charts. Histogram and let's just go boom. Now it gave me these buckets. These look pretty good. These are the buckets they gave me. Sometimes you have to adjust the buckets to get a picture that you think best represents the data, but this looks pretty good. So I'm just gonna delete this and say, okay, well, the original data set is not exactly bell-shaped. It's kind of skewed to the right. Now, if you create your own data set and you were to say randomly, you might create a data set where you say equals rand between boom and like one and let's say 75 or something like that and then and then copy it down 392 times what would you expect the histogram to look like you would expect it not to be bell-shaped but uniformly distributed you can you can do that if you want if you want to if you want to use that method to kind of practice this same concept you can do that as well but the idea here is that it's not normally uh distributed but we still want to use concepts related to a bell-shaped curve, right? That's going to be the idea. So let's go ahead and make this larger so I could fit that in here. And then I'll make this one a little smaller. So there's our data. Okay, so what are we going to do? Let's make a, let's make a skinny H. And, and then I'm going to put it over here. So these are going to be our samples. And I'm gonna say that we're gonna have the um, numbers in the sample. I'm just gonna make 15, which we probably should make it a little bit larger, but I'm gonna keep it at 15 because that's what the example has. So I'm gonna select these two and copy that out to 15. So oftentimes around 30 or 40 uh, is, is safer depending on the size of your population. Another thing to point out here as we do this obviously the number of items in the sample can have an impact but it's not a direct relationship as you would think in terms of how large does your sample have to be compared to the population so that's another thing that's a little counterintuitive i'm going to make this black and white in other words you'd think the larger the population the larger your sample would have to be but that relationship is not exactly intuitive uh, like that and the analogy is like if you were to uh, test soup and you had a little pot of soup and you wanted to see how much salt is in it you just need to test a little bit of it and see if it's salty or not and if you had a huge bucket of soup that's going to feed a whole like church group or something you still only take a spoonful you don't have to you know sample the entire bucket right similar kind of analogy here but let's test let's keep going here so this is gonna be, then we'll do the count of the number of samples. And how many did I do over here? I think I did like a hundred. So we're doing a lot of them, uh, a lot of different samples. I, th I think I did like 500 just to do a whole bunch of different samples. So we're gonna say like 500 different samples just to get an idea, which is an overkill. But we did the samples over and over again of 15 so the two things that we can vary then gonna make this black and white are gonna make this black and white the number in the sample and then the number of samples right that we can we can take all right now let's let's i'd like to take random samples so i'm going to use actually an index in order to do this a couple ways to the methods to take a random sample you could make random numbers in the table and then shuffle this around and then you'll get a random a random column every time but if i want to pull from this population possibly another method might be easier to use and that's going to be using this index formula
we're going to say equals index index i'm going to take the array of our data control shift down control backspace to get back up and then comma the next argument what do i want it to do i want it to pick random numbers from that array so i'm going to use the rand and i want to use random between random between that one usually it's like what we looked at before where you want to put a bottom and top point like a 1 to 50 but this time the numbers represent the places in the rows that i want to be drawing from so when I say I'm going to go from number one, that means I want you to start at the top of the data set. It doesn't mean these rows. It means the top of the rows of the data. This is number one, not this. And then I want it to go up to the bottom of the data set. There are 392 uh, items in the data set. So comma 392, close it up and enter. Okay, so there it picked up a random item, hopefully from that data set out of that one now let's double click on it and say if i copy this down what do i have to do to copy this down and across i need to make this absolute f4 f4 dollar sign before the letters and the numbers because i don't want this to move these are hard coded no problem enter let's put our cursor on this one and copy it to the right so there's our number of samples so here's a sample of 15 so we got these random numbers out of a sample of 15 and then I'm going to select all of these, copy it down, and imagine we repeated that process uh, way too many times, 500 times, right? But just to give, get an idea of an overkill of doing that 15 samples over and over again. All right. So let's let's take this again. I'm holding shift, control shift down, and I'm going to make that bordered and blue. So there is that. All right. So now let's look at look at our data set over here and let's take the average. So now I'm going to take the mean of of the samples. And this is the key of course. I'm going to say format paint that over here. The mean is the average adding all of these up and divided by 15 of course equals the average tab. I'm holding control shift. I don't want to pick up that one though. So shift back and then enter there's the average so of this data set the middle you know the average is uh 113 i'm going to copy that down double click in the fill handle copying it down home tab font group border and blue so there we have it there so now let's make a skinny z and look at the mean of the means so now i'm taking the mean of all the means of all the different samples so the mean of means, I'm going to call it for now. Double click to make it a little bit larger here. This is going to be equal the average of all the averages. So we did 500 samples of 15 <laughs> and we took the average of all the averages. We come up to 104. I'm going to add some decimals, home tab, number group, add some depth decimals. What did we have before? So this is the, uh, let's let's make here right under, underneath it the mean of the pop the pop mean population the actual mean of the entire population is 10447 adding some decimals so we're gonna we have a difference difference between our sample mean and our pop mean which is very small very small difference and and of course that would that would make sense right and if for example and we'll prove this later we took a whole lot of 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 samples in order to get a, a close number if i was to take every combination here i would get basically the exact uh mean so if i did all the possible combinations and i'll just prove that to test that later we'd get the exact we'd get the exact number but we'll take a look at that concept in a bit the idea here here of course being that we can be we can be pretty confident about that number and the more different uh, combinations of samples if they're randomly generated samples or if we have all the different combinations we should be pretty close to the actual mean why is that important that's going to be important because remember if we're looking at a bell-shaped curve we need to know the middle point that's that's the mean and we need to know the standard deviation 
All right, so I'm going to say a home tab, font group, uh, brackets, and blue. So now let's take a look at the STD of the sample, the STDs of the sample, uh, instead of the population. So now I'm going to say this is going to be the STD of the sample. Uh, now, now I'm taking all of the sample means now. I'm not looking at one individual sample. I'm looking at the sample means, the spread of the sample means is what this uh, represents. Control shift down, enter. So now we have uh, 10. Now we expect, of course, the, the spread of the data to be different than the population mean. So in other words, if I go back on over here and I say, what was the STD of the population? Not the mean, what did I put mean here? Well, yeah, means. Uh, this one is the population. So this equals the STD of the population, which we already did, which was right here. So let's hold on a second. What did I do? I'm just going to say equals that one. I could have done it again. So, so the standard deviation of all of the means is not the same as the standard deviation of the original population. Now we can kind of approximate what we expect the difference uh, to be, which again, we'll dive into later, but obviously we expect the standard deviations of the mean to be, to be tighter around that central point than the original population. Let's go make this brackets and blue. And then uh, let's go ahead and build basically a, a table of our outcomes. So I wanna make our buckets table and use a frequency distribution. So I'm gonna do this fairly quick. I'm gonna say the min, let's take our smallest number over here. This equals the min. What's our smallest number that came out? D -d 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 -d. Control shift down and enter. So it's an 82 uh, and then the max, what's the highest number that we got over here equals the max number is going to be do, 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 control shift down. It's going to be a 133. So I'm going to do intervals then, meaning my buckets, how many buckets do I want? I'm going to say I want like 20 buckets. So I'm going to say an interval. I'm going to take the difference of this minus this. I'm going to take that whole thing, put brackets around it because I want to do that first and then divide by 20 because that's the number of buckets I would like to make. And that comes out to uh, an interval of about 3.88. All right, I'm going to approximate that when we make our buckets over here. So I'm going to say, all right, the buckets are going to start at, let's say, let's make this a little smaller. Let's make this, let's go over here and say format paint that over here. Let's make this blue and bordered, blue bordered as we go. So my buckets, and this is gonna be the bucket number. Let's make this black and white. Home tab, font group, making this black and white. Let's center it while we're here. Let's, let's make the, the bottom number 75, and let's say we're gonna make them go up by around three. So I'm not gonna pick these numbers because it's gonna change all the time. So that approximates around 75 and I'll have them go up in intervals of three. So I'm going to say this is going to be 75 plus three. And then I'm going to copy that down until I get to around 140. So I'm going to copy that down and say do, 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 do 120, uh, 126, do, 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 140 about. Let's do that. All right, so that's my ending point of my buckets. I'm gonna use a frequency distribution, frequency, just so you can see it, uh, to pick this up. So we're gonna say this equals the frequency tab. Now, what does the frequency do? It's gonna be picking up uh, the numbers up to, but I don't believe not including the 75, and then everything from 75 up to 78, and then everything from 78 up to 81 and so on and so forth. It's, pu it's putting them into the buckets. So let's say the data and we'll pick up the data array, control shift down and enter. This is 
Uh, hold on a second. Okay, Paso. We're going to say... Oh, it needs the bends, of course. You need the data and then comma. You need the bends. All right, so I'm going to put my bends over here. Control shift down, control backspace. So here's the whole formula. We've got the frequency. You've got the, the data array and then uh, the bends. And it should spill out. It's a spill array formula. So there they are. So boom, we have the spill out. And then if I take the total and I say equals the sum, or let's just say alt equals. Uh, did I do that right? It didn't do it again. Alt equals sums it up. That comes out to 500. So we took our 500 items, our 500 samples, and broke them out in a frequency distribution by the mean, by bucket, 0 to 75, none of those currently, and then 75 to 78, none of those from 78 up to, but not including 81, two of those from 81 up to, but not including 84, six of those, and so on and so forth. There are our buckets. Let's say control shift down on this one and put some borders around it and make it uh, blue. So then I can say, all right, let's take that and make a histogram from that information. So I can take this and say control shift down, not taking the total, control backspace. And let's just go to insert and then go to the charts and put in just a histogram. Let, let it do uh, the histogramming bit of it. Hold on a second. I need to take, wait, let's not do it that way. Let's actually, let's actually do the buckets and then, or let's do it this way. I'll take control shift down, not including those backspace and let's go to insert and then charts and then put the drop down here and put a line chart. So there we have it. Let's do something like that. All right. So now we can see it's it's got more of a bell shaped. And if I keep on clicking on this, it'll change because we have the randomly generated numbers. But you can see it's keeping more of a bell shape. Now I'm going to adjust this bottom one because the buckets are wrong. So I'm going to say, let's delete this here. And let's go into the chart and add our data. And I'm going to say over here on the horizontals, I want to make those my buckets starting at 75, control shift down, control backspace. And then I usually have to click this just to make sure it picks up. Once I see this string of numbers, I'm confident that it picked it up and it shows it down there. So now we have our, our data, which you can see now is becoming more of a bell shape. So now we have more of a bell shaped curve. So we started with something with the actual data that is skewed to the right. We took the mean of all the means. And uh, when and when we plot that, we, we have the central point, which is coming out very close because we did a whole bunch of samples. So that's good to know about the bell-shaped curve. And then we have the standard deviation uh, here that we have populated with the curve. So remember, those are the two key points that we'll get into in more detail in future presentations when we get into like hypothesis testing. Let's just practice, however, uh, making a actual bell curve uh, from this this information. And so let's let's say let's make this one larger. I'll pull this over here, and then I'll make this smaller, and we'll just practice making our bell curves. So I'm going to say that the the upper and lower st with a standard deviation of four so when i make my bell curve based on this information i'm going to say well what's the upper point of the curve that's going to include all of the curve and the lower these are going to be the x's that we'll be putting in now these this information keeps on changing but because it's random but the idea is going to be equal the central point is going to be the mean. So we'll take this mean here, and then we're gonna say, how spread out is this going to be on the up on the upper end? So it's gonna say plus the spread, which is the standard deviation, which for the sample is the 9.96 times, and we're gonna go four standard deviations out. 
which is going to include almost all of the data, right? So that's going to be up to 148. And then I'm going to say that on the lower side, let's pick up the mean again. So we'll pick up the mean. And then we're going to say minus then the uh, standard deviation of this and then times four. So that means we're gonna have a spread from the low to the high of around 66 to 141. Let's go up top and just practice. I'm gonna make a skinny here and we're gonna say this is gonna be our X's and this is gonna be our P of X, probability of X. I'm gonna make this black and white, home tab, font group, and we'll make this black and white. I'll do it fairly quickly because I plan on repeating this you know, multiple times here, and we've seen it in prior courses or sections, but it's just, this is the core to make a picture. So you could sometimes make a picture with just a line chart or a bar chart, and sometimes it's useful to show the actual bell curve with an area uh, chart here. So we're gonna say, all right, so, so let's use, actually practice the sequence function to count our numbers. So we want a sequence, sequence, and this is gonna say, what, what are the rows? I'm gonna say the difference between these rows, I wanna say this minus this. Now I don't want those to keep changing all the time though. So I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna hard code them in here and say about 145 minus about you know 65, let's say, is the number that we're gonna want. And then usually I'm gonna, usually you have to add one because it's gonna subtract those two and then add one, then comma, I'm sorry, comma. And then the columns, I just want one column. And then comma, the starting point that we want to have is gonna be that 64, I'm gonna say 65 in our case. 65 and then comma what steps do we want i just want to take steps of one number at a time just one number at a time one and uh boom so there it has it it spills out if i say control shift down then you've got 145 now you could do that a different way you could just start at 65 and then say 66 and then copy that down to 145 that's totally fine as well it's just sometimes that sequence is a little bit easier and I just want to practice using that. Now we're going to use our normal distribution function. We looked at a prior course or section equals the norm dot dist. We'll return to these uh, shortly in the future. But now that we have an idea that it should be bell shaped, we're going to approximate the perfect bell shaped curve. So norm dot dist for this X comma the mean. I'm going to be picking up the mean over here. So we'll pick up this mean. F4 on the keyboard, because I'm going to copy that down, comma, the standard deviation. I'm going to pick up this standard deviation, the smaller one, the one from for the means. And let's go back on over. Do, 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 do. Okay, and then F4 on that, because I want to copy it down. And then comma, I don't want it to be cumulative. Therefore, I'm going to enter a zero and then enter. I'll make that a percent so I can recognize percentified or recognize, add some decimals, double click the fill handle, copying it down. So there we have it, boom. If I say control shift down and check, does it add up to 100%? It does, that makes me feel like I've got something correct, hopefully. Let's select this whole thing, home tab, font group, let's make this bordered and blue. Okay, so now I just wanna practice making uh, our chart from this. Before I do, let's actually calculate the Z as well. So the Z is looking in terms of standard deviations. How far away from the central point are we talking? Not in terms of X's, but Z's standard deviations. Uh, let's go ahead and format paint this over here. How do you calculate the Z? It's equal to brackets the X minus the central point, which is going to be the mean closing that up and divided by the standard deviation, which is gonna be this standard deviation for the samples. And then I wanna copy that down. Therefore, this X needs to change. This one doesn't. F4, keep that solid. 
This one doesn't change. F4 dollar signs before the letters and the numbers for the second two. Enter. Put my cursor on it. Add some decimals. And then double click copying it down. And then I'm going to say brackets and blue. Now there is going to be another one that we're going to use here. So I want to format this over here that we'll take a look at with that Z score shortly. Now let's just select all of our percents, control shift down, control backspace, and then I'm going to insert charts. This time I'm going to add another chart, go to the all charts and then add the area chart, area chart. Boom. All right. So I'm going to get rid of the title and then I'm going to go back into the data. I want to pick up my X's. So I'm going to go to the, to the, where you have to go to pick up your X's. I got to go to Texas. That's where they're at. My X's are all in Texas. Sorry, that's a song. I don't really have any X's in Texas. All right. So I'm going to say then here's this and this. All right. There it is. So we're going to say, okay. And then, okay. So now we have our, our X's in place. So there's our, our graph. Uh, if we were to have a perfect bell shaped curve, which again, now we can kind of make predictions on using the perfect shape of the bell shaped, which we'll talk in hypothesis testing in future presentations. It's useful to get the Z down here though. So oftentimes we're looking at that endpoints, which are like two standard deviations away. So let's just do the generic two standard deviations away. So I'm going to put up top. I'm going to put this little thing, which is a, which is a comma. No, it's a, I don't even know what that is, but you know where that is on the keyboard. It's two, two things, right? It's right of the semicolon. And then it's going to be, it's going to be, I want to call this label it negative two. And then negative two needs to be less than uh, Z. And then Z needs to be less than positive two. And that should just type it in if I, do it that way. So there it is. And now let's make a formula for that. So I'm going to actually populate the middle part. I want to show all of these X's for a Z that is between negative two and positive two. How can I do that? We're going to use an if then logic test. So we're going to say equals if tab, we're going to embed in it an and function a and d because there are two conditions that both have to be met in order to fulfill the logic test the first one is that we want this number to be it needs to be greater than needs to be greater than negative two and the next logic test comma is that this number also so we're going to click that number again needs to be less than a positive two so less than positive two and greater than negative two. That ends the and part of our function. So I'm going to close up the brackets, which takes me back to the outer function, which is the if part of it, which I've completed the logic test now. So I'm going to say comma, that takes me to the value. What do I want to do if it, if it passes that test? I don't want it to give me the Z score. I want it to give me the percent. So I want this number and then comma. What if it doesn't pass the test? I want you to leave it blank so it doesn't pick up in the graph. So I'm going to put quotes, space quotes, because it's a text field. And we put quotes around text fields, closing it up and enter. Nothing is there. That's okay. If I copy it down, double click, then when we get into the range, something is there that looks correct. Hopefully home tab number group, let's percentify to recognize, add some decimals. So there it is. Now I'm going to go back to my chart. Let's go ahead and control shift down here, make that home tab font group border blue. So we have it formatted. So now within the chart, we're going to say chart design data, and I want to add another data set. So I want to say add a data set, and then it's going to be named uh, this. And then the data, I'm going to delete this bit here, put my cursor up top, control shift down. I want to go back up to the top. So control backspace, it doesn't show up yet. So I'm going to hit this and click it again, which I shouldn't have to do, but I want it to pop up here and possibly on the graph to prove that it's happening. That's the orange bit in the middle now that has populated. So I need to do something else if I want to have the Z scores down here as a second label. That's why I need, so I'm going to double click on the orange one. That gives me the, the 
item to the right. I want to have a secondary axis now. Puts this axis over here. I don't need this bit over here. I'm going to delete that. But now that allows me to then go into the data set, go to the second series where I want to have a secondary X axis, that being the Z scores. So then I'm going to select this side, select the Z scores, control shift down, control backspace. And then I'm going to click on this to make sure it shows up. Boom, boom. And then there, so now the dots are there. So I think it's good. I'm going to say, okay. And it doesn't show up yet until I hit the plus button on the axes and I have to add the secondary axis, which now shows up. So there it is. And I picked the wrong data set. So I'm going to say, wait a sec, that's not the Z scores, but it looks correct otherwise. So I'm going to go back here and say chart design data, and then say this one secondary edit these. That's the wrong set of data. What are you doing? You want the Z scores. Here they are, control shift down, control backspace. And then I'm going to select this again and again to see it popularly, properly populate. There's my Z scores. That makes sense. All right, so now I'm going to say, okay, okay. Click on this again. I want it at the bottom. So I'm going to select this axes, give me more detail. Make sure I have this top one selected. Go to the labels. And then I want to bring this down uh, to the bottom where what happened in the labels area right here. We want to bring it low, bring it low. There it is. So now it's on the bottom. I like it down there better. So there we have it. Okay. Now, now note that you can also add like a cheater line here. That's not on the graph. So it's often useful to just make a shape I find and just say, boom, let's just make a line here and say, okay, let's make it like green. And then that'll help me when I have this graph lined up to say, where's my actual data, right? Here it is by Z score down here. Z score is at zero and then it goes, goes negative in the middle and then positive up top. And then here are my X's. So you can see here we have do, 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 do. It's, it's at that bit, it's around two and over here, it's around uh, negative two on the Z score because most of the data is in the middle. When we start doing hypothesis testing, you can have these tails that you can populate the tails or you might just use a cheater thing like this. And basically now this doesn't, when I change the size of the screen, you know, sometimes this little, this thing gets messed up. So it's not perfect, but it's a great little tool just for visualization. One of the problems with Excel I find is that, is that I was never good at hand drawing these graphs, which was a real handicap uh, because the visualization is important. Excel allows us to draw these beautifully, but it's difficult to get the idea down. So the question is, what kind of graph do I need? Maybe this graph, like a graph with a line chart is all you need. Uh, and then you use this as the data. In other words, you might select like this information and say, maybe I just need a graph that looks like that looks like uh like this right and then i can just use my instead of an area graph and then i can use something like like this to uh uh i'm gonna say uh i'm gonna say cut it and then paste it uh hold on a sec paste it now i messed it up undo undo okay Let's just make another one. Then I can use, you know, my little cheater tool to visualize what is happening, inserting this, boom. And then I can kind of visualize, okay, now what's happening if I'm over this line or that line? Or I might use, I can say control shift down. I might say I'd rather see just like a line graph, something uh, more like this. And then maybe I can have multiple graphs on one sheet because they're more transparent this way. And then again, I can use my little cheater tool here and say, all right, let me just try to visualize this thing by putting uh, my line on top of it and saying, okay, where's that con compared to my X for, oh no, I picked the wrong tool. Oh no, go away, go away thing. I wanted a line. And so I can say insert 
just my line like that. That's the one I want. And then I can just basically say, and I can use that as my shorthand tool to kind of figure out. Now these X's are wrong. I'd have to fix the X's, which would be chart design, data, edit. The X's are gonna be control shift down, control backspace for that one. And then click this to make sure that that pulls up. And then we have this format, right? So now I can pick my own right items here. But if I want that secondary Z, then it's then you might need to do the area. So this one I can fix my X's over here. I can say data, my X's, my X's are in Texas. I try to stay out of Texas because that's where the X's are. But I have to deal with the X's. So here we go. Here we go. We're going to say, okay. So that's the general idea. We'll practice uh, making more of these charts more and more as we go because getting the visuals is helpful.